All right, good evening. Um, and welcome back again. This is Amuna Yisrael, and we have a great guest today. It's Brother Avi. He has signed on to read a little bit with us in the Left Project. So we're so excited. Yes, yes, yes. For those who have just joined us once again, this is the 11th installment of this book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And we're going to have Brother Abia uh, read chapter 29, Preparations for Her Escape. So if you're just joining us and you're not sure yet, um, a few episodes ago, I say episodes, but a few chapters ago, she's been up there for five, six years. And um, her daughter, Ellen, went to New York and she's ready to get up out of there. You know, she's fearing that she may become a cripple. Uh, Dr. Flint has not given up and searching for her. And so we're going to see what happens in this chapter. So how are you doing this evening, Abia? Doing well. Doing well. How are you, sister? I'm doing excellent. I'm doing excellent. So I'm going to go ahead and let me make sure I put it here on social media. We're going to go ahead and start. We're going to give you the mic so that you can read. Oopsie. Chapter 29. So the mic is yours. Okay. I just want to make sure that I get to the correct chapter. Okay, preparations for escape. Yes. <clears throat> I hardly expect that the reader the reader will credit me when I affirm that I lived in that little dismal hole, almost deprived of light and air, and with no space to move my limbs for nearly seven years. But it is a fact and to me, a sad one. Even now, for my body still suffers from the effects of, effects of that long imprisonment. To say nothing of my soul, members of my family now living in New York and Boston can testify to the truth of what I say. Countless were the nights that I sat late at the little loophole scarcely large enough to give me a glimpse of one twinkling star. There I heard the, the patrols of slave hunters conferring together about the capture of runaways, <clears throat> well knowing how rejoiced they would be to catch me. Season after season, year after year, I peeped at my children's faces and heard their sweet voices with a <clears throat> heart yearning all the while to say, your mother is here. Sometimes it appeared to me as if ages had rolled away since I entered upon that gloomy, <clears throat> mountainous existence. At times I was stupefied and listless as at other times I became very impatient to know when these dark years would end. And I should again be allowed to feel the sunshine and breathe the pure air. After Ellen left us, this feeling increased. Mr. Sands had agreed that Benny might go to the north whenever his uncle Philip could go with him. And I was anxious to be there also to watch over my children and protect them so far as I was able. More, moreover, I was, I was likely to be drowned out of my den. If I remained much longer, for the slight roof was getting badly out of repair and Uncle Philip was afraid to remove the shingles. At least someone should get a glimpse of me. <clears throat> when storms occurred in the night, they spread mats and bits of carpet, which in the morning appeared have been laid out to dry but to cover the roof in the daytime might have attracted attention consequently my clothes and bedding were often drenched a process by which the pains and aches in my cramped and stiffened limbs were greatly increased i revolved various plans of escaped escape in my mind, which I sometimes imparted to my grandmother when she came to whisper with me at the door at the trap door. The kind hearted old woman had an intense sympathy for runaways. She had known too, too much of the cruelties inflicted on those who were captured. 
Her memory always flew back at once to the sufferings of her bright and handsome son, Benjamin, the youngest and dearest of her flock. So whenever I alluded to the subject, she would groan out, oh, don't think of it, child. You'll break my heart. I had no good old, I had no good old Aunt Nancy now to encourage me, but my brother William and my children were continually beckoning me to the north. And now I must go back a few months in my story. I have stated that the 1st of January was the time for selling slaves or, or leasing them out to new masters. If time were counted by heartthrobs, the poor slaves might reckon years of suffering during that festival so joyous to be free. On the New Year's Day preceding my aunt's death, one of my friends named Fanny was to be sold at auction to pay her master's debts. My thoughts were with her doing my thoughts were with her doing all the day and at night I anxiously inquired what had been her fate. I was told that she had been sold to one master and her four little girls to another master far distant that she had escaped from her purchaser and was not to be found. Her mother was the old Aggie and I, the old Aggie I had spoken of. She lived in a small tenant belonging to my grandmother and built on the same lot with her own house. Her dwelling was searched and watched, and that brought the patrols so near me that I was obliged to keep my very to keep very close in my den. The hunters were somehow eluded, and not long afterwards, Benny accidentally caught sight of Fanny in her mother's hut. He told his grandmother, who charged him never to speak of it, explaining to him the frightful consequences, and he never betrayed the trust. Aggie little dreamed that my grandmother knew where her daughter, daughter was concealed and that the stooping form of her old neighbor was bending under a similar burden of anxiety and fear. But these dangerous secrets deepened the sympathy between the two old persecuted mothers. My friend Fanny and I remained many weeks hidden with all within call of each other, but she was unconscious of the fact. I longed to have her share my den, which seemed a more secure retreat than her own, but I had brought so much trouble on my grandmother that it seemed wrong to ask her to incur greater risk. My restlessness increased. I had lived too long in bodily pain and anguish of spirit. Always I was in dread that by some accident or some contrivance, slavery would succeed in snatching my children from me. This thought drove me nearly frantic, and I determined to steer for the North Star at all hazards. At this crisis, provident, Providence opened an unexpected way for me to escape. My friend Peter came one evening and asked to speak with me. Your day has come, Linda, said he. I have found a chance for you to go to the free states. You have a fortnight to decide. The news seemed too good to be true, but Peter explained his arrangements and told me all that was necessary for me to, to say I would go. I was going to answer him with a joyful yes when the thought of Benny came to my mind. I told him the temptation was exceedingly strong, but I was terribly afraid of Dr. Flint's alleged power over my child and that I would not go and leave him behind. Peter remonstrated earnestly, 
he said such a good chance might never occur again that Benny was free and I could be sent to me and could be sent to me and that for the sake of my children's welfare I ought not hesitate a moment I told him I would consult with Uncle Philip my uncle rejoiced in the plan and bade me to go by all means he promised if his life was spared that he would either bring or send my son to me as soon as I reached a place of safety I resolved to go but thought nothing had had better be said to my grandmother till very near the time of departure but my uncle thought she would feel it more keenly if I let her if I left her so suddenly I will reason with her he said and convince her how necessary it is not only for your sake but for hers also you cannot be blind to the fact that she is sinking under her burdens I was not blind to it I knew that my concealment was an ever-present source of anxiety and that and that the older she grew the more nervously fearful she was of discovery my uncle talked with her and finally succeeded in persuading her that it would absolutely that it was absolutely necessary for me to seize the chance so unexpectedly offered the anticipation of being a free woman proved almost too much for my weak frame the excitement stimulated me and at the same time bewildered me i made busy preparations for my journey and for my son to follow me i resolved to have an interview with him before I went that I might give him cautions and advice and tell him how anxiously I should be waiting for him at the north grandmother stole up to me as often as possible to whisper words of counsel she insisted upon my writing to dr. Flint as soon as I arrived in the free states and asking him to sell me to her she said she would sacrifice her house and all she had in the world for the sake of having me safe with my children in any part of the world if she could only live to know that she could die in peace I promised the dear old faithful friend that I would write to her as soon as I arrived and put the letter in a safe way to reach her but in my mind I resolved that not another cent of her hard earnings should be spent to pay uh, respacious slaveholders for for what they had for what they call their property and even if I had not been unwilling to buy what I had already a right to possess common humanity would have prevented me from accepting the generous offer at the expense of turning my age relative out of house and home when she was trembling on the brink of the grave I was to escape in a vessel but not but I forbear my to mention any further particulars I was in readiness but the vessel was unexpectedly detained several days meantime news came to town of a most horrible murder committed on a fugitive slave named James charity the mother of this unfortunate young man had been an old acquaintance of ours I have told the shocking particulars of his death in my description of some of the neighboring slaveholders my grandmother always nervously sensitive about runaways was terribly frightened she felt sure that a similar fate awaited me if I did not desist from my enterprise she sobbed and groaned and entreated me not to go her excessive fear was somewhat contagious and my heart 
was not proof against her extreme agony. I was grievously disappointed, but I promised to relinquish my project. When my friend Peter was appraised of this, he was disappointed and vexed. He said that judging from our past experience, it would be a long time before I had, before I had such another chance to throw away. I told him it need not be thrown away that I had a friend concealed nearby who would be glad enough to take the place that I had been that had been provided for me. I told him about poor Fanny and the kind hearted noble fellow who never turned his back upon anybody in distress, white or black, expressed his readiness to help her. At <clears throat> Aggie as much surprised when she found that we knew her secret, she was rejoiced to hear of such a chance for Fanny. And arrangement, arrangements were made for her to go on board the vessel the next night. They both supposed that I had long been at the, at the North, therefore my name was not mentioned in the transaction. Fanny was carried on board at the at the appointed time and stowed away in a very small cabin. This accommodation had been purchased at a price that would pay for a voyage to England. But when one proposes to go to find old England, they stop to calculate whether they can afford the cost of the pleasure while in making a bargain to escape from slavery. The trembling victim is ready to say, Take all I have, only don't betray me. The next morning, I peeped through the loophole and saw that it was dark and cloudy. At night, I received news that the wind was ahead and the vessel had not sailed. I was exceedingly anxious about Fanny and Peter too, who was running a tremendous risk at my instigation. Next day, the wind and weather remained the same. Poor Fanny had been half dead with fright when they carried her on board, and I could readily imagine how she must be suffering now. Grandmother came often by my den to say how thankful she was I did not go. On the third morning, she waited for me to come down to the storeroom. The poor old sufferer was breaking down under her weight of trouble. She was easily flurried now. I found her in a nervous, excited state, but I was not aware that she had forgotten to lock the door behind her as usual. She was exceedingly worried about the detention on the vessel. She was afraid of all, she was afraid all would be discovered and then Fanny and Peter and I would be tortured to death and Philip should be utterly ruined and her house would be torn down. Poor Peter, if he should die such a horrible death as the poor slave James had lately done, all, all for this kindness in trying to help me and for trying to help me how dreadful it would be for us all. Alas, the thought was familiar to me and had sent many a sharp pain through my heart. I tried to suppress my own anxiety and speak soothe, soothingly to her. She brought in some allusion to Aunt Nancy, the dear daughter she had recently buried, and then she lost all control of herself. As she stood there trembling and sobbing, a voice from the piazza called out, where is you, Aunt? Marthy, grandmother was startled at grandmother was startled startled and in her agitation opened the door without thinking of me. In, st in step Jenny, the mischievous housemaid who tried to enter my room when I was concealed in the house of my white benefactress. It's been hunting everywhere for you, Aunt Martha, she said. 
My missus wants you to send her some crackers. I had slunk down behind a barrel, which entirely screened me, but I, but I imagined that Jenny was looking directly at the spot and my heart beat violently. My grandmother immediately thought what she had done and went out quickly with Jenny, with Jenny to count the crackers locking the door behind her. She returned to me in a few minutes, the perfect picture of despair. Poor child, she exclaimed. My carelessness has ruined you. The boat ain't gone yet. Get ready immediately and go with Fanny. I ain't got another word to say against it now, for there is no telling what may happen this day. Uncle Philip was sent for and he agreed with his mother and thinking that Jenny would inform Dr. Flint in less than 24 hours. He advising, he advised getting me on board the boat if possible. If not, I had better keep very still in my den where they could not find me without tearing the house down. He said it would not go, he said it would not do for him to move in the matter because suspicion would be immediately excited, but he promised to communicate with Peter. I felt reluc reluctant to apply to him again, having implicated him too much already, but there seemed to be no alternative. Vexed as Peter had been by my indecision, he was true to his generous nature and, and said at once that he would do his best to help me, trusting I should show myself a stronger woman this time. He immediately proceeded to the wharf and found that the wind had shifted and the vessel was slowly beating downstream. On some pretext of urgent necessity, he offered two boatmen a dollar apiece to catch up with her. He was a lighter com complexion than the boatman he hired. And when the captain saw him, saw them coming so rapidly, he thought officers were pursuing his vessel in search of the runaway slave he had on board. They hoisted sails, but the boat gained upon them and the in the vegetable Peter sprang on board. The captain at once recognized him Peter asked him to go below to speak about a bill he had given him. When he told his errand, the captain replied, why the woman's here already and I put her where you or the devil would have a tough job to find her. But, is, but it is another woman I want to bring, said Peter. She is in great distress too and you shall be paid anything within reason if you'll stop and take her. What's her name? inquired the captain. Linda, he replied. That's the name of the woman already here, rejoined the captain. By George, I believe you mean to, you mean to betray me. Oh, exclaimed Peter, God knows I wouldn't harm a hair on your head. I'm too grateful to you, but there, but there really is another woman in great danger. Do you have the humanity to stop and take her? After a while, they came to an understanding. Fanny, not dreaming I was anywhere about in that region, had assumed my name, though she called herself Johnson. Linda is a common name, said Peter, and the woman I want to bring is Linda Brent. The captain agreed to wait a certain place till evening being handsomely paid for his detention. Of course, the day was an anxious one for us all, but we concluded that if Jenny had seen me, she would be too wise to let her mistress know of it, and that she probably would not get a chance to see Dr. Flint's family till evening, for I knew very well what were the, what the, I knew very well what were the rules in that household. I afterwards believed that she did not see me for nothing ever came of it. And she was 
one of those base characters that would have jumped to portray a suffering fellow being for the sake of a for the sake of 30 pieces of pieces of silver i made all i made all my arrangements to go on board as soon as it was dusk the intervening time i resolved to spend with my son i had not spoken to him for 7 years though i had been under the same roof and seen him every day when i was well enough to sit at the loophole i did not dare venture beyond the storeroom so they brought him there and locked us up together in a place concealed from the piazza door it was an agitating interview for us both after we had talked and wept together for a little while he said mother i'm glad you're going away i wish i could go with you i knew you was here and i have been so afraid they would come and catch you i was greatly surprised and asked him how he had found it out he he replied i was standing un under the eaves one day before ellen went away and i heard somebody cough up over the woodshed i don't know what made me think it was you but i did think so i missed ellen the night before she went away and grandmother brought her back into the room in the night and i thought maybe she'd been to see you before she went for i heard grandmother whisper to her now go to sleep and remember never tell i asked him if he if he ever mentioned his suspicions to his sister he said he never did but after he heard the cough if he saw her playing with other children on the side of the house he, on the side of the house he was always he always tried to coax her round to the other side for fear they would hear me cough too he said he had kept a close lookout for dr flint and if he saw him speak to a constable or a patrol he always told grandmother i now recollected that i had seen him manifest uneasiness when people were on the side of the house and i had at the time been puzzled to conjecture a motive for his actions such prudence may seem extraordinary in a boy of 12 years but slaves being surrounded by mysteries deceptions and dangers early learn to be suspicious and watchful and prematurely cautious and cunning. He had never asked a question of grandmother or uncle Philip. And I had often heard him chime in with other children when they spoke of being at the North. I told him I was now really going to, to the free States. And if he was good, and if he was a good, honest boy, and a loving child to his dear old grandmother, the Lord would bless him and bring him to me. And when Ellen would, and we and Ellen would live together. He began to tell me that grandmother had not eaten anything all day. While he was speaking, the door was unlocked and she came in with a small bag of money, which she wanted me to take. I begged her to keep a part of it at least to pay for to pay for Benny's being sent to the to the north, but she insisted while her tears were falling fast that I should take the whole. You may be sick among strangers, she said, and they would send you to the poorhouse to die. All that good grandmother. For the last time I went up to my nook, its desolate appearance no longer chilled me, for the light of hope had risen in my soul. Yet even with the blessed prospect of freedom before me, I felt very sad at leaving forever that old homestead where I had been sheltered so long by the dear old grandmother, where I had dreamed my first young dream of love and where after that I faded away 
my children came to twine themselves so closely round my desolate heart. As the hour approached for me to leave, I again descended to the storeroom. My grandmother and Benny were there. She took me by the hand and said, Linda, let us pray. We knelt down together with my child pressed to my heart and my other arm round the faithful, loving old friend I was about to leave forever. On no other occasion has it ever been my lot to listen to a fervent, a supplication for mercy and protection. It thrilled through my heart and inspired me with trust in God. Peter was waiting for me in the street. I was soon by his side, faint in body, but strong of purpose. I did not look back upon the old place, though I felt that I should never see it again. All right. Thank you so much for that. That was the voice of Brother Avi uh, reading the 29th chapter. She's preparing for escape. Uh, how did you feel on that chapter, brother? Uh, a lot, a lot took place. It was, you know, I could kind of just reading it, uh, relate, not necessarily relate, but, you know, at least empathize with the sense of anxiety of thinking that she was going to leave and then backing out and then, you know, going back to the point of leaving just the uh, entire um, uncertainty of the whole event. Right. It's um, like you said, it, it is like seesaw back and forth. Her grandmother, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that tears you, you know, you don't want to stay in slavery, but then again, you don't want to leave the people you love. So the, it, it was a wild situation that she was in. Yeah, and just kind of walking on eggshells and not knowing what's going to happen, the, the boat or the vessel, as they describe, you know, just sitting there and not knowing what's going on and thinking that they may be caught or, you know, also thinking about the the uh, the others that were on board, how they're feeling, you know, a lot going on in that chapter. Yeah, definitely a lot going on. So stay with us. I'm going to bust out chapter 30. It's a shorter one. I know that one. First time on, we gave you a longer chapter to bust out. You must be like, my goodness, this chapter ain't never going to end. <laughs> no, it's all good. So I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 30. Please stay on so we could uh, discuss it. I love it. And for those who are listening, if you desire to read or just have a conversation live on here, like you see, Brother Abia, you can do that as well. The invitation is always open. This is the Lev Project. My name is Amuna Yisrael, and I'm going to read chapter 30. It says, Northward Bound. I never could tell how we reached the wharf. My brain was all of a whirl, and my limbs tottered under me. At an appointed place, we met my Uncle Philip, who had started before us on a different route, that he might reach the wharf first, and gave us timely warning if there were any danger. A rowboat was in readiness as I was about to step in. I felt something pull me gently and turning round, I saw Benny looking pale and anxious. He whispered in my ear, I've been peeping in the doctor's window and he's at home. Goodbye, mother, don't cry, I'll come. He hastened away. I clasped the hand of my good uncle to whom I owed so much and of Peter, the brave, generous friend who had volunteered to run such terrible risks to secure my safety. To this day, I remembered how his bright face beamed with joy. And when he told me he had discovered a safe method for me to escape, yet that intelligent, intelligent, enterprising, noble hearted man was a chattel, liable by the laws of the country that calls itself civilized to be sold with horses and pigs. He parted in silence. Our hearts were all full for words, all too full for words. Swiftly, the boat glided over the water. After a while, one of the sailors said, don't be downhearted, madame. We will take you safely to your husband in. At first, I could not imagine what he meant, but I had presence of mind to think that it probably referred to something the captain had told him. So I thanked him and said, I hope we should have pleasant weather. When I entered the vessel, the captain came forward to meet me. He was an elderly man with a pleasant countenance. He showed me to a little box of a cabin where sat my friend Fanny. 
she started as if she had seen a scepter, a spectre, sorry. She gazed on me in utter astonishment and exclaimed, Linda, can this be you or is it your ghost? When we were locked in each other's arms, my overwrought feelings could no longer be restrained. My sobs reached the ears of the captain who came and very kindly reminded us that for safety, as well as our own, it would be prudent for us not to attract any attention. He said that when there was a sail in sight, he wished us to be kept below, but at other times he had no objection to our being on deck. He assured us that he would keep a good lookout, and if we acted prudently, he thought we should be in no danger. He had represented us as women going to meet our husbands in blank. We thanked him and promised to observe carefully all the directions he gave us. Fanny and I now talked by ourselves low and quietly in our little cabin. She told me of the suffering she had gone through in making her escape and of her, ter her terrors while she was concealed in her mother's house. Above all, she dwelt on the agony of separation from all her children on that dreadful auction day. She could scarcely credit me when I told her of the place where I had passed nearly seven years. We have the same sorrow, said I. No, replied she, you are going to see your children soon and there is no hope that I should ever hear from mine. The vessel was soon under way, but we made slow progress. The wind was against us. I should not have cared for this if we had been out of sight of, of the town. But until there were miles of water between us and our enemies, we were filled with constant apprehensions that constables would come on board. Neither could I feel quite at ease with the captain and his men. I was an entire stranger to the class of people, and I heard that sailors were rough and sometimes cruel. We were so completely in their power that if they had, if they were bad men or situation, our situation would be dreadful. Now that the captain was paid for our passage, might he not be tempted to make more money by giving us up to those who claimed us as property? I was naturally of a confiding disposition, but slavery had made me suspicious of everybody. Fanny did not share my distrust of the captain or his men. She said she was afraid at first, but she had been on board three days while the vessel lay in dock and nobody had betrayed her or treated her otherwise than kindly. The captain soon came to advise us to go on deck for fresh air. His friendly and respectable manner con con combined with Fanny's testimony reassured me and we went with him. He placed us in a comfortable seat and occasionally entered into conversation. He told us he was a southerner by birth and, and had spent the greater part of his life in slave states and that he had recently lost a brother who traded in slaves. But said he, it is a pitiable and degrading business. I always felt ashamed to acknowledge my brother in connection with it. As we passed Snaky Swamp, he pointed to it and said, there is a slave territory that defies all the laws. I thought of the terrible days I had spent there and thought it was not called Dismal Swamp. It made me very dismal as I looked at it. I shall never forget that night. The balmy air of the spring was so refreshing. And how shall I describe my sensations when we were finally sailing on Chesapeake Bay? Oh, the beautiful sunshine, the exhilarating breeze, and I could enjoy them without fear of restraint. I had never realized what grand things air and sunlight are till I had been deprived of them. 10 days after we left land, we were approaching Philadelphia. The captain said we should arrive there in the night but he thought we would better wait until morning and go on shore and board daylight as best way to avoid suspicion. I replied, you know best, but will you stay on board and protect us? He saw that I was suspicious and said he was sorry now that he had brought us to the end of our voyage to find I had so little confidence in him. Ah, if he had ever been a slave, he would have known how difficult it was to trust a white man. He assured us that we might sleep through the night without fear that he would take care, care we were not left unprotected, but it said to the honor of this captain, but it, but it said to the, um, be it said to the honor of this captain, southerner as he was, that if Fanny and I had been white ladies and our passage lawfully engaged, he could not have treated us more respectfully. My intelligent friend Peter had rightly estimated the character of the man to whom's honor he had entrusted us. The next morning I was on deck as soon as the day dawned, I called Fanny to see the sunrise for the first time in our lives on free soil. For such I believed it to be, she says, believe. 
We watched the reddening sky and saw the great orb come up slowly over the water as it seemed. Soon the waves began to sparkle and every thing caught the beautiful glow. Before us, the city of strangers. We looked at each other and the eyes of both were moistened with tears. We had escaped from slavery and we were supposed ourselves to be safe from hunters. But we were alone in the world and we had left dear ties behind us. Ties, cru ties cru cruelly sundered by the demon slavery. That is the ending of the reading of chapter 30. They made it. <laughs> and like she said, supposedly freedom. Brother Abia, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, what do you think about that? Um, you know, it's as you were reading and as I was reading along, it, it kind of um, reminded me of, um, and I, well, let me first start by saying like I'm I'm originally from the South, like from Mississippi, uh, born and raised there. And even now, um, you know, in adulthood and being other places, uh, just from the experiences of um, even uh, as I was growing up, you know, the segregation in the South now, I mean, you know, things had been technically desegregated at the time, but, you know, there were still things like, you know, railroads that divided the town, like, you know, the, the black side from the white side and things like that. And schools were essentially still segregated. So the, um, the kind of undying, um, suspicion and uncomfortableness that they had, even though the captain, um, was, you know, very nice and respectable. I, I find myself being able to relate to, um, even now, not, being able to be fully comfortable in the presence uh, of a situation where I'm the only quote unquote black, you know, person and, you know, it's just, it's something, you know, it's just something to, uh, that maybe not everyone can relate to, but it's definitely a serious thing to where you never kind of like, you never feel comfortable unless you're around your own, you don't feel comfortable letting your guard down, your guard down, even if people are being nice and they're, you know, uh, and being respectable or they seem like they could be okay. Um, it's no really necessarily condemn condemnation on the individual. It's just that they have to uh, understand, uh, you know, your, your past and the history that, that you have. Okay. Agreed. For those who have just joined us, this is the Left Project. We have a beautiful guest here today, um, Brother Abia. He's been reading, and, and um, we're just sharing and having a conversation that I hoped I would we would. So I'm just very excited for this opportunity to converse um, real time. And so finally, they made it to the. If you just tuned in, finally they made it. Actually, you know the situation as it happened. She didn't expect for her friend to go, but her friend is with her now, um, based on the fact that she bowed out the first time around. And she ended up getting on it. So they're in the quote unquote city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. And brother Abia, if you don't mind, this one is a little bit shorter. So I, I didn't I didn't slap it on you too much this time. So if you don't mind, I'm so excited for you to be here. If you want to read chapter 31, that'll be okay with me. Uh sure, I could do that. So chapter 31 incidents in Philadelphia. I had heard that the poor slave had many friends at the north. I trusted we should find some of them. Meantime, we would take it for granted that all were friends till they proved to, to the contrary. I sought out the, the kind captain, thanked him for his attentions, and told him I should never cease to be grateful for the service he had rendered us. I gave him a message. I gave him a message to the friends I had left at home and he promised to deliver it. We were placed in a rowboat and in about 15 minutes, we landed on a wood wharf in Philadelphia. As I stood looking round, the friendly captain touched me on the shoulder and said, there is a respectable looking colored man behind you. I will speak to him about the New York trains and tell him you wish to go directly on. I thanked him and asked him to direct me to some shops where I could buy gloves and veils. He did so and said he would take 
he would talk, excuse me, he would talk with the colored man till I returned. I made what haste I could. Constant exercise on board the vessel and frequent rubbing with salt water and had nearly restored the use of my limbs. The noise of the great city confused me, but I found the shops and bought some double veils and gloves for Fanny and myself. The shopman told me they were so many levies. I had never heard the word before, but I did not tell him so. I thought if he knew I was a strange, I thought that I thought that if he knew I was a stranger, he might ask me where I came from. I gave him a gold piece, and when he returned the change, I counted it and found out how much a levy was. I made my way back to the wharf where the captain introduced me to the colored man as the Reverend Jeremiah Durham, minister of Bethel Church. He took me by the hand as if I had been an old friend. He told us we were too late for the morning cars to, to New York and must wait until the evening or the next morning. He invited me to go home with him, assuring me that his wife would give me a cordial welcome. And for my friend, he would provide a home with one of his neighbors. I thanked him for his for such for, for such kindness to strangers and told him if I must be detained, I should like to hunt up some people who formerly went from our part of the country. Mr. Durham insisted that, that I should dine with him. And then he would assist me in finding my friends. The sailors came by to bid us goodbye. I shook their hand, I shook their hearty hands with tears in my eyes. They had all been kind to us and they had rendered us a great service, a greater service than they could possibly conceive of. I had never seen so large a city or been in contact with so many people in the streets. It seemed as if those who passed looked at us with an expression of curiosity. My face was so blistered and peeled by sitting on deck in wind and sunshine that I thought they could not easily decide to what nation I belong. Mr. Durham met me with a kindly welcome without asking any questions. I was tired and I'm sorry, Mrs. Durham met, we, met me with a kindly welcome and without asking any questions. I was tired and her friendly manner was a sweet re refreshment. God bless her. I was sure that she had comforted other weary hearts before I had received her sympathy. She was surrounded by her husband and children in a home made sacred by protecting laws. I thought of my own children inside. After dinner, Mr. Durham went with me in quest of the friends I had spoken of. They went from my native town and I anticipated much pleasure in looking on familiar faces. They were not at home and we retraced our steps through streets delightfully clean. On the way, Mr. Durham observed that I had spoken to him of a daughter I expected to meet, that he was surprised for I looked so young he had taken me for a single woman. He was approaching a subject on which I was, was extremely sensitive. He would ask about my husband next, I thought, and if I answered him truly, what would he think of me? I told him I had two children one in New York, the other at the South. He asked some further questions. I frankly told him some of the most important ev events of my life. It was painful for me to do, to do it, but I would not deceive him. He was desirous of being my friend and thought he ought to 
know how far I was worthy of it. Excuse me if I have tried your feelings, said he. I did not question you from idle curiosity. I wanted to understand your situation in order to know whether I could be of any service to you or your little girl. Your straightforward answers do you credit, but don't answer everybody <clears throat> so openly. It might give some heartless people a pretext for treating you with contempt. The word contempt burned me like coals of fire. I replied, God alone knows how I have suffered, and he, I trust, will forgive me if I am permitted to have my children. I intend to be a good mother and to live in such a manner that people cannot treat me with contempt. I respect your sentiments, said he. Place your trust in God and be governed by good principles and you will not fail to find friends. When, when we reached home, I went to my room, glad to shut out the world for a while. Uh, sorry, give me one second. Okay, uh, the words he has spoken made an indelible impression upon me. They brought up great shadows from the mournful past. In the midst of my meditations, I was startled by a knock at the door. Mrs. Durham entered, her face all beaming with kindness to say that there was an anti-slavery friend downstairs who would like to see me. I overcame my dread of encountering strangers and went with her. Many questions were asked concerning my experience and my escape from slavery, but I observed how many careful, I observed how careful they all were not to say anything that might wound my feelings. How gratifying this was can be fully understood only by those who have been accustomed to be treated as if they were not included within the pale of human beings. The anti-slavery friend had come to inquire into my plans and to offer assistance if needed. Fanny was comfortably established for the present with a friend of Mr. Durham. The anti-slavery society agreed to pay her expenses to New York. The same was offered for me, but I declined to accept it telling them that my grandmother had given me sufficient to pay my expenses to end of my journey. We were urged to remain in Philadelphia a few days until some suitable ex escort could be found for us. I gladly accepted the proposition for I had a dread of meeting slaveholders and some dread also of railroad railroads. I had never in entered a railroad car in my life and it seemed to be quite an important event. That night I sought my pillow with feelings I had never carried to it before. I verily believed myself to be a free woman. I was wakeful for a long time and had no sooner fallen asleep than I was roused by fire bells. I jumped up and hurried on my clothes. Where I came from, everybody hastened to dress themselves on such occasion. The white people thought a great fire might be used as a good opportunity for insurrection and that it was best to be in readiness. And the colored people were ordered out to labor in extinguishing the flames. There was but one engine in our town and colored women and children were often required to drag it to the river's edge and fill it. Mr. Durham's daughter slept in the same room with me and seeing that she slept through all the den, I thought it was my duty to wake her. What's the matter, she said, rubbing her eyes. They're screaming fire in the streets and the bells are ringing, I replied. What of that, said she drowsily. We are used to it. We never, we never get up without the fire is Without the fire is very near, what good would it do? 
I was quite surprised that it was not necessary for us to go and help fill the engine. I was an ignorant child just beginning to learn how things went on in great cities. At daylight, I heard women crying fresh fish, berries, radishes, and various other things. All this was new to me. I dressed myself at early hour and sat at the window to watch that unknown tide of life. Philadelphia seemed to be a wonderful, great place. At the breakfast table, my idea of going out to drag the engine was laughed over, and I, and, and I joined in the mirth. I went to see Fanny and found her so well con contended among her new friends that she was in no haste to leave. I was also very happy with my kind hostess. She had had advantages for her education and was vastly my superior. Every day, almost every hour, I was aiding, I was adding to my little stock of knowledge. She took me out to see the city as much as she deemed prudent. One day she took me to an artist's uh, room and showed me the portraits of some of her children. I had never seen any paintings of colored people before and they seemed to me beautiful. And the end of, at the end of five days, one of Mrs. Durham's friends offered to accompany us to New York the following morning. As I held the hand of my good hostess in a parting class, I longed to know whether her husband had repeated to her what I had told him. I suppose he had, but she never made an allusion to it. I presume it was the delicate silence of womanly sympathy. When Mr. Durham handed us our tickets, he said, I'm afraid you will have a disagreeable ride, but I could not procure tickets for the first class cars. Supposing I had not given him money enough, I offered more. Oh no, he said, they could not be had for any money. They don't allow colored people to go in the first class cars. This was the first chill to my enthusiasm about the free states. Colored people were allowed to ride in a filthy box behind the white people at the South, but there were, but they were not required to pay for the privilege. It made me sad to find out the North aped the customs of slavery. We were stowed away in a large rough car with windows on each side too high for us to look out without standing up. It was crowded with people apparently of all nations. They were plenty of beds and cradles containing screaming and kicking babies. Even other man had it. Every other man had a cigar or pipe in his mouth and jugs of whiskey were handed out, handed around freely. The fumes of the whiskey and the dense the tobacco smoke were sickening to my senses and my mind was equally nauseated by the coarse jokes and billboard songs around me. It was a very disagreeable ride. Since that time, there has been some improvement in these matters. All right, thank you so much. That's the voice of Brother Abia, trooping it out. We all, we rounding out the backside of this book here, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, we're up to chapter 32 he just read chapter 31 for those of you who just joined us we started at chapter 29 she escaped out of her little cubby hole there she was there for almost seven years um she and another friend they were finally able to get an escape they got to philadelphia but if you remember the earlier chapters her daughter is in um new york and so this is where she's trying to get to to meet finally meet her daughter ellen again uh what were your thoughts on that chapter brother um uh i would say i mean it i guess it, it seemed you know she, she, she was having a good time in philadelphia where they were it was you know good to see or to read that uh you know they had 
come into the uh, the homes of you know very generous and kind-hearted people uh it was you know at the end of the chapter chapter a little bit of i guess for her a wake-up call an unfortunate one to find out that some of the uh the things that she thought that she had escaped right in the south were you know still present in the north right true this this is just to show us i think like i've been saying the value of just hearing the voices of our four parents what they went through the thoughts that they had you know nothing new under the sun and you know you have these thoughts that if only i did this if only i did that things would be better and they may be better you know in in different measures but not to the fullness of, of true and real freedom or a uh, level of sovereignty so i'm gonna go ahead since we're on the roll here i'm gonna bust out this last chapter I just added it on. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll bust out this last chapter. It's easier when you alternate it and you have other people to read. So I'm going to yeah. do two, and then we're going to wrap it up for the night. And again, if anybody would like to share in this conversation, feel free to hit me up on social media or under this video, and we can arrange for you to come in and read as well. And I want to thank our, our brother Abiyah for, for sharing as well. And, pro, and actually, when the project start, first started, he was one of the supporters who said, you know, sis, I will share it. So I just want to thank you so much for doing that and just being a supporter of the project. Right, no problem. Thank you for having me. Okay. So I'm going, I'm going to read 32 here. It says, the meeting of mother and daughter. When we arrived in New York, I was half crazed by the crowd of coachmen calling carriage man. We bargained with one to take us to Sullivan Street for 12 shillings. A burly Irishman stepped up and said, I'll take you for six shillings. The reduction of half the price was an object to us, and we asked if we could take us right away. Trough and I will, ladies, he replied. I noticed that the hackmen smiled at each other, and I inquired whether his conveyance was decent. Yes, it is decent. It is, ma'am. <laughs> Devil a bit, and I'll be after taking ladies in cab that was not decent. We gave him our che cheeks. We went for the baggage and soon we appeared saying, this way, if you please, ladies. We followed and found our trunks on a truck and we were invited to take our seats on them. We told him that was not what we bargained for and we must take the trunks off. He swore they should not be touched till we paid him six shilling. In our situation, it was not prudent to attract attention and I was about to pay him what he required when a man nearby shook his head for me not to do it. After a great ado, we got rid of the Irishman and had our trunks fastened on a hack. We had been recommended to a boarding house in Sullivan Street and thither we drove. There Fanny and I separated. The anti-slavery society provided a home for her and I afterwards heard of her in a prosperous circumstances. I sent for an old friend from my part of the country who had for some time been doing business in New York. He came immediately. I told him I wanted to go to my daughter and asked him to aid me in procuring an interview. I cautioned him not to let it be known to the family that I had just arrived from the South because they supposed I had been at the North several years. He told me there was a colored woman in Brooklyn who came from the same town I did and I had better go to her house and have my daughter meet me there. I expected the proposition. I accepted the proposition, thankfully, and agreed to escort me to Brooklyn. We crossed Fulton Ferry, went to Myrtle Avenue, and stood at the house he designated. I was just about to enter when two girls passed. My friend called my attention to them. I turned and recognized in the eldest, Sarah, the daughter of a woman who used to live with my grandmother, but who had left the South years ago. Surprising and rejoiced at this unexpected meeting, I threw my arms around her and inquired concerning her mother. You take no notice of the other girl, said my friend. I turned and there stood Ellen. I pressed her to my heart, then held her away from me to look at her. She had changed a good deal in two years since I parted from her. Signs of the neglect could be discerned by eyes less observant than a mother. My friend invited us all to go into the house, but Ellen said she had been sent on an errand, which she, should, she would do as quickly as possible and go home and ask Mrs. Hobbs to let her come and see me. It was agreed that I should send for her the next day. Her companion, Sarah, hastened to tell her mother of my arrival. And when I entered the house, I found the mistress of it absent and I waited for her return. Before I saw her, I heard her saying, where is Linda Brent? I used to know her father and mother. Soon Sarah came with her mother. She was quite a company of us all. She was there, so there was quite a company of us all from my grandmother's neighborhood. 
These friends gathered round me and questioned me eagerly. They laughed, they cried, and they shouted. They thanked God that I had got away from the persecutors and was safe on Long Island. It was a day of great excitement. How different, different from the silent days I had passed in my Jerby den. The next morning was Sunday. My first waking thoughts were come occupied with the note I was to send to Mrs. Hobbs, the lady whom Ellen lived. That I had recently come into the vicinity was evident. Otherwise, I should have sooner inquired for my daughter. It would not do to let them know I had just arrived from the South, for that would involve the suspicion of me of my having been harbored there and might bring trouble if not ruin on several people. I like a straightforward course and I'm always reluctant to resort to subterfuge. So far as my ways have been crooked, I charge them all upon slavery. It was that system of violence and wrong which now left me no alternative but to act, enact a falsehood. I began my note by stating that I recently arrived from Canada and was very desirous to have my daughter come to see me. She came and brought a message from Mrs. Hobbs inviting me to her house and assure me that I need not have any fears. The conversation I had with my child did not leave my mind at ease. When I asked if she was well treated, she answered yes, but there were no heartiness in the tone. And it seemed to me that she said it from an unwillingness to have me troubled on her account. Before she left me, she asked me very earnestly, mother, when will you take me to live with you? It made me sad to think that I could not give her a home till I went to work and earned the means. And that might take me a long time. When she was placed with Mrs. Hobbs, the agreement was that she would be sent to school. She had been there two years and was now nine years old. She scarcely knew her letters. There was no excuse for this, for there were good public schools in Brooklyn, okay, not no more, to which she could have been sent without expense. She stayed with me till dark and I went home with her. I was received in a friendly manner by the family and all agreed in saying that Ellen was a useful good girl. Mrs. Hobbs looked me coolly in the face and said, I suppose you know what my cousin, Mr. Sands has, wait, hold up, let me back up. I suppose you know that my cousin, Mr. Sands has given her to my eldest daughter. Oh, dude is bugging out, <laughs> sorry. She will make a nice waiting maid for her when she grows up. I did not answer a word. How could she? Who knew by experience the strength of a mother's love and who was perfectly aware of the relation Mr. Sands bore to my children? How could she look me in my face with the thrust while she thrust such a dagger into my heart. I was no longer surprised that they had kept her in such a state of ignorance. Mr. Hobbs had formerly been wealthy, but he failed and afterwards attained a subordinate situation in the custom house. Perhaps they expected to return to the South someday and Ellen's knowledge was quite sufficient for a slave's condition. I was impatient to go to work and earn money that I might change the uncertain position of my children. Mr. Sands had not kept his promise to emancipate them. I had also been deceived about Ellen. What security had I with regard to Benjamin? I felt that I had none. I returned to my friend's house in an uneasy state of mind. In order to protect my children, it was necessary that I should own myself. I called myself free and sometimes felt so, but knew I was insecure. I sat down that night and wrote a civil letter to Dr. Flint asking him to state the lowest terms on which he would sell me. And as I belonged by law to his daughter, I wrote to her also making a similar request. Since my arrival at the North, I had not been unminded, sorry, unmindful of my dear brother William. I had made diligent inquiries for him and having heard of him in Boston, I went there. When I arrived, I found he had gone to New Bedford. I wrote to that place and was informed he had gone on a whaling voyage and would not return for some months. I went back to New York to get employment near Ellen. I received an answer from Dr. Flint, which gave me no encouragement. He advised me to return and submit myself to my rightful owners. And then any request I might, any request I make would be granted. I lent this letter to a friend who lost it. Otherwise I would present a copy to my readers. That is the end of the reading of chapter 30, 32. Uh, yeah, just like she said, don't trust a European. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. And that, that he's the father of the children. And he promised he would emancipate them, and he didn't. That's crazy. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, a few things about that chapter. It, it, um, 
I, I'm, I was trying to recall who said it, but like them keeping her, her uh, them keeping her daughter in such a state of, you know, uh, lack of education yeah. and knowledge about things. I'm not sure if it was Booker T. Washington or maybe Frederick Douglass or someone. And it may be a misquote, I'm not sure, but they said that, um, you know, knowledge or education or something of that nature makes a, a man or, you know, a person unfit to be a slave. So, you know, they, they, you know, the intent is to keep you ignorant and, and not knowing anything. So, you know, you, you can't do for yourself or anything. And then just seeing her, um, you know, tr trying to, after having escaped, trying to buy her freedom yeah. and some, and in some cases, you know, essentially I feel like even now in 2016, we're still in that position to where uh, many of us are still trying to, uh, we, you know, we think that we're free, but we're still trying to uh, buy our freedom. Okay. Wow. That's deep. That's deep. And, and she realized that, that, like she said, she's that in easiness, I agree to this day, how many years later, this was 18. She pens this book in, I believe, 1861. So well over a hundred plus years later, like you said, many, of us here in the diaspora still in that position you may can walk and come and go but to really do what you feel you need to do there are all these red tapes you know um that's kind of hindering you or stopping you so that's very interesting it's very interesting we're rounding up the end of the book here and so definitely we want to see what what takes place um i still can't believe although i can't believe it that he 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 kept saying that he would release the children and this is something that this, uh, often slave masters did. They would father these children and basically be a d deadbeat dad. That's what I was saying a few episodes ago. They are the they are the poster child for what it is like to be a deadbeat dad. <laughs> <I'm just> yeah. <laughs> they showed you how to do it. Yes. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. How you do it. You fill up on some slave girls. You know. You breed them up, and then you leave them to take care of the child. You understand? So that's um. A lot of these things are coming straight out of slavery um, and from beyond. So definitely. Anything else you'd like to say before before we wrap it up this night? I hope you can join us again, and and those who are listening, feel free to join us as well. For as we round up the end of this book, incidents in the life of a slave girl, brother Abia, is there anything that you would like to share with the people before we go? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to uh, join again. Hope you know if uh, if time permits and read. I want to uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to come on and participate. And I want to, if anyone is listening, uh, definitely encourage our people to, uh, to to read these narratives and to read these books so we can really get an understanding of what our four parents have gone through. I, I find that in a lot of cases, I you know, I, I hear and see complaints from uh, people that they are tired of slave movies and I know like when uh, 12 years a slave was released released in theaters people were saying that they were tired of it and I think that it's um it's it's really a, a sore spot you know yes to, 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 to think about or to uh to, to witness some of those things but we want to try to um kind of ignore it and unfortunately that's not you know that's not a good thing to do it's not going away <laughs> yeah it's not going away at all so I, I thank you so much for that after this we're gonna read a very it's a short one but that one is powerful uh, like I said before it's the name after we read this we should be done by Sunday so starting next week and it like I said it's a short narrative the name of the person is a European man he was a surgeon on the ships his name is Alexander Falconbridge and that's also a free, all of these things, you know what's wild about this? A lot of this information is free. I mean, they, yeah. they have uploaded it to the internet. They put it, if you don't want to buy the book, you don't have to. You can literally click on a link and access and go back into 1861, go back into the 1700s. So the only thing that's stopping us is us. Um, if you yeah. really want understanding about who we're dealing with and what this is really all about. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that one because that one is wild. He's going to describe all about what happens in Africa when he was on his slave emissions. I mean, this is stuff that we don't have to. It's outside of the, the realm of memes. You know, you don't really see him just popping up all over social media. This is something you got to dig a little bit for, but it's very interesting information. So um, 
Once again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This has been the uh, part 11 of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This is our second segment of uh, the Left Project. So I pray everybody have a blessed night. Once again, thank you, Brother Abia, for coming on. And um, again, if you would like to join in and have your voice be heard, just hit us up and then we can make it happen. Until next time, everybody have a blessed night.